titled, Man-Made Religion Versus the Religion of Jesus. Man-Made Religion Versus the Religion of Jesus. And I want to challenge you with this idea that there are only two kinds of religions. And you're thinking, well, there's religion from China and India and North American Indians and, and the Middle East. There's all these different religions. Europe had different religions before Christianity came. But here's what I want to tell you. There's only two religions. Religion the way Jesus taught it and human-made religion. And human-made religion has a way of saying we are the true people. Everybody else is less than human. We are special in God's sight. Everybody else is, is less so. Uh, our culture is best. Our ways are best. Other people, less so. And human-made religion always has a way of lowering God's glory and elevating humanity. Because it gives you a list of things. If I do this, if I do that, then I will be accepted to the gods. I will be acceptable to the heavens or, or God or Allah. If I do these things, then God will... So what does that mean? It means God's standards are pretty low. Christianity says that God's standards are perfection. And all of us will fall short. All of us fail. And that's why we need grace. And so that's why I'm saying there's only two kinds of religions. Religion that humanity makes as we try to reach out for God. And religion that God has given us as He reaches down to us in love and says, take a hold of my hand, I'll save you. So keep that in mind as we study today. Pontius Pilate. He's actually only known to us, primarily he's known to us in scriptures. People think that because Rome was such a great empire that they had all these great records, and it's true, they did, but many of them have been lost in history. So we only have a, a few, several, uh, several extra biblical accounts of uh, Pontius Pilate. Uh, early Christian tradition outside the Bible believes that he committed suicide. Uh, however, later Christian tradition disagrees. There's even some accounts that he himself became a believer. Uh, Roman belief, at least one Roman historian's belief, is that uh, he fell out of favor with the emperor and was sent into exile. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus mentions Pontius Pilate several times. Again, not just a biblical character, but a historical figure. Uh, as as uh, again and again we see the scriptures. You know what? Here's the honest truth. Not all of this has been proven by history. But you know what? We won't be honest truth. None of it has been disproven by history. And the more we learn, the more it's confirmed. So uh, Pontius Pilate is mentioned several times uh, in the works of Josephus. The Jewish philosopher Philo mentions him. And the Roman historian Tacitus uh, says that Christus, Christ, uh, who is the founder of Christianity, called him Christus, was executed under Pilate during the reign of Emperor Tiberius. And so there's an extra biblical reference, an early reference by the historian Tacitus, both to Christ and to Pontius Pilate. Now, Tiberius, Emperor Tiberius, he's, he's interesting. You always think that the Roman emperors were very hostile towards Israel to the Jewish people, and for the most part, that's true. But he was known as a friend to the Jewish people, and maybe a little bit was self-preservation. He, he knew that there was a hard, hard territory to control, and he wanted to keep things settled down. But he had very progressive policies towards the Jews that allowed them a fair measure of autonomy. That's why you have King Herod, who was uh, at least a, partially a Jew. But Pilate's immediate superior underneath Tiberius was a fellow named uh, St. Janus. And St. Janus is also known to us from history, and he was the commander of the Praetorian Guard, which was the personal guard of the Roman Empire. And he was a friend of the emperor. He had the emperor's ear, ear Emperor Tiberius. So at one time, when Emperor Tiberius was off somewhere, he was actually controlling the entire emperor himself. He had Pontius Pilate, St. Janus, uh, and then the emperor. But when the emperor was away, Sir Jasper put charge of the entire uh, empire, and he even executed the son of the emperor for, for treason. <clears throat> a very powerful person. And St. Janus hated the Jews. So, when Pontius Pilate got in charge of the territory of Israel, he took a bunch of standards and shields and flags that had the image of the emperor he tried to set them up around Jerusalem. 
that really angered the Jews because that looked like idolatry to them. They didn't want to have the emperor, his standard, his image set up everywhere. So they started to protest, and this protest was peaceful, but Pilate thought, well, I'm going to intimidate him, scare him. So he scattered his soldiers in plain clothes among the population. And he said, when I get the signal, I want you to all draw their swords, and they're all going to run. We'll scatter the crowd. So this huge crowd gathered together to protest what they saw as idolatry in Jerusalem. And at a certain mark, Pontius Pilate gives them the signal, and they pull out their swords, and the Jewish men fell down and bared their necks and said, kill us rather than profane the city of Jerusalem. And Pontius Pilate lost that one. He realized that he's in a lot of trouble with empire if he initiates the slaughter of the crowd here. And so, uh, which would probably cause a revolt. So he backed off, and uh, and he was he was probably doing that to try to uh, curry favor with both the emperor, but also Satanus who was uh, directly above him. But he failed in that attempt. Now. So possibly to appease his boss, Pilate uh, tried these harsh measures, but they backfired. And that backfire then angered the emperor, who was actually also close. You know, Herod the Great had all these sons that were ruling. He was close to the sons of Herod. And so he was, uh, the sons of Herod complained to the emperor. Uh, and the emperor wanted peace in the region, and he knew that it was only a small shelf away from Chaos and Rebellion. After Pilate's boss, I mean, this fellow named St. Well, the emperor started to think, as head of the Praetorian Guard, seems like he wants to slap me. So Satanus was then executed by his friend, Emperor Tiberius. Now, Pilate is in the uncomfortable position of persecuting the Jews to leave Satanus. Now Satanus is gone. He has to try to show that he is loyal not to Satanus, but to Tiberius. And so what he did was he thought, well, this time I'm going to bring the, the emperor's standards into the city, but I'm not going to have his image because that offends the Jews, but I want to show Tiberius, I'm your man. So he had the name of the emperor on all the standards, and the Jews protested that, and, uh, and the sons of Herod wrote letters that went directly to, to uh, Emperor Tiberius. And then also there was an unfortunate scene where, where he killed a lot of Samaritans, uh, in a different event. And so Pontius Pilate is uh, severely censured by the emperor and he's living in fear of offending the Jews now. So a guy who came in angry and frustrated with the Jewish people is now in a situation where he's living in fear of the Jews. He, he probably tried to raise these standards during the Feast of Tabernacles in A.D. 32. After that was probably when Christ was crucified. And so by the time Jesus is brought before him to be executed, he is really timid and he's being bought, bullied by the Jewish population that he's supposed to govern. In Luke 23, verses 11 and 12, he had this tension with the Herods. But Luke 23, verse 11, alludes this and said, Herod and his soldiers, after treating Jesus with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before that they had been enemies with one another. Isn't that neat how history kind of uh, collaborates and shows us a little bit of background for what the scriptures tell us? So again, today we're going to see God in flesh, Jesus, teaching things that are contrary to human nature. See, natural religion flows naturally out of the human heart. It comes easy. Uh, Actually, I've seen some of my Muslim friends actually brag about the fact that Islam is very much like natural religion. Uh, you would ex it comes out of things you would expect to be true, whereas Christianity can only be believed if the special re revelation is true because it's so different than all the other religions. And on this point, I agree with my Muslim friends. Yes, their religion is very similar to the world's religions, and yes, Christianity does stand apart. So Christianity, as revealed in the New Testament, as revealed by the Scriptures, is contrary to human-oriented, human-originated religion. It has several elements, okay? First, uh, and I already mentioned this, people like us are good and God's favorites. And you even have some Indian tribes and in, in the ancient Chinese and a lot of different cultures 
calling themselves the one true people. We're the true people. Everybody else is less than human. Uh, other people are wicked. We're good. Other people are wicked. So as we do our religion, we pat ourselves on the back and feel better to every other culture. That's human religion. Secondly, if I do good, then God or the gods will reward me with what I want. If something bad happens to someone, they also must deserve it. And this is a key component of human-made religion, that we can just read the tea leaves or, or get a goat's intestines or something and study those. And we, we can just look at the situation and say, well, this is bad happening to them because they did this or that. Or this is good happening to them, so they must be blessed by God. Uh, three, all things happen for a reason and are controlled by God or the gods. We are helpless before the mandate of heaven and have no free will, which is the Greek concept of fate or the Hindu concept of determinism, uh, but a concept largely foreign to the Old Testament. Okay, Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5. And this reminds me of a sermon that we had a couple weeks ago. Uh, remember when the fellow called out to, to Jesus and said, Tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. Remember that? Look at this. Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5. Everybody there? It's good to have your Bibles. This, this, is, the, this is a love letter from God. It shows us his very heart. And, uh, and it's, it's good to fall in love with the scriptures. These are beautiful words of life, saving us from eternal separation from God, saving us from ignorant about the things of God, uh, being ignorant about the things of God. Okay, chapter 13 of Luke. Remember Jesus is talking to this big crowd. We've gone over that for the last couple of weeks. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. We don't have any uh, extra biblical record of this, which again, not surprising. This is a long time ago. But apparently some of these Galileans had done something that, uh, that Pilate didn't approve of. Uh, some people think it might have been even the beheading of John the Baptist, and he couldn't go after Herod directly, so he went after his underlings. But uh, that's what some of the early church thought, but we don't know that for sure. But anyways, uh, Pontius Pilate decides to kill these folks as they're trying to give their sacrifices to God. So it looks like you take a holy thing, offering sacrifices to God, they're killed right there on the spot, so he mixed their blood with their sacrifices, which of course is an abomination. So this person is angry and he wants to know, Jesus, what do you think about that? Pilate, this Roman, this foreigner, is mixing people's own blood with their holy sacrifice to God. Now this is a big question. And in the crowd, of course, is upset about this. They're sick of a foreign occupation by godless people. They're sick of this government uh, controlling them and having all this power and doing such a, a horrible thing like killing somebody as they're offering their sacrifices in the temple. And so how does Jesus respond? Does he say, well, we're all supposed to like the government. Does he say, down with Rome? This is very, very interesting. And Jesus, again and again, is different. He is other than we are. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Wow. That got personal quick. Jesus, what do you think about this bad government? Unless you repent, you're going to eternally perish and be separate from the living God. Wow. I couldn't help but think that this might have some application for us in this political season. Verse 4, or those 18, Jesus expands it to another story. Those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them, a tower fell on them. Well, what, are we gonna, what do we usually say? Well, all things happen for a reason. Well, I guess God wanted to take them out. Well, I, they, they must have been horrible sinners for that. Towers just don't fall on people. How'd that tower fall on them? They must have, Jesus says, do you think they were more guilty than all of the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent... You too will all perish. He's talking to the crowd. We saw last week Jesus has this powerful come to Jesus moment, right? Get right with the judge before you reach judgment day. 
And here Jesus is going back to this, repent, repent, turn from your sins message. It reminded me, this whole situation reminded me again of that teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And we would think, yeah, that's right. It should be fair, divide it up fairly. Jesus says, man, who made you? Who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to him, I want you to beware. Be on your guard against every form of greed. For one's life does not consist of what he possesses. Jesus turned that on his head. We, we're worried about what's fair. Give us our money. And Jesus says, you know what's going to undo you? Not being poor. Not your brother having all the money. What's going to undo you is your greed. It's going to separate you from God. And here they've got a political idea, and it's, it's also religious. The government has profaned the temple. And they're coming at it and want to hear it. Give us a statement, Jesus. He says, I'll give you a statement. You too will perish unless you repent. It's hard to imagine Jesus disappointing the crowd any more than he did and frustrating them. And Jesus is always trying to drag people from our natural, human-oriented way of thinking and says, okay, you're, you're really roused up about this. Now, ugh, here's where I want you to be oriented towards the things of God. And he's going to bust some chops. Jesus could have responded to the immediate situation or, or to the, of the inheritance or to the immediate situation of Pilate's barbarism He could have talked about money. He often talks about money. He could have talked about politics. Instead, both times, Jesus transitions to talk about something else that in his mind is more important. Each person better get right with God. Each person better get right with God. Each person had better get right with the living God. Repent or you too will die. Imagine being in Israel at that time. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a powder keg. It's about ready to explode. Not long after Jesus' death and resurrection, they do rebel against Rome. And that's what gets the whole temple destroyed. And you know, they were righteous. Rome had no business to be there. Their, their cause was just. But you know what they lost? They lost their country from 70 A.D. till 1948. That was a a foolish fight for them. The situation, righteous nation of Israel, is under the rule of Gentile, uncircumcised pagans. Now, is God angry with injustice? You bet he is. Was Rome getting God's stamp of approval? No. No. But I want you to think of it this way. It would be like ISIS burning down a church when the people were inside praying, mixing their blood with their prayers, and Jesus turns it from a political, righteous indignation to a matter of a personal response to God. Isn't that hard to hear? I think it was hard for that audience to hear. I really think what Jesus said was very difficult. We read over these things so quick, don't we? Without thinking, my goodness. Why didn't Jesus cuss out the Romans? Shouldn't he have? Instead, he's making it personal. Repent. Each one of you better repent or you're going to face an eternity without the, living, without the love of the living God. Get right with God. Natural religion, you know what they would have done? Natural religion A human, religious person would have told the people, you're good, you're the people of God, you are so good, you're so special, you're so unique. The Romans are bad. And you know what? We've got clerics all over the Middle East telling their people how they're good and the West is bad. And if we're not careful, we in the West kind of close our Bibles and make up a Christianity where we're good because we're Westerners and the rest of the world is bad because they're not. God loves us and not them. Of course, Jesus died for the sins of the what? The world. Our culture is best. Jesus does not go there, and that was the time he should have if he thought the way we do. This is the difference between God's religion and man-made religion. He doesn't even talk about Rome. 
Instead, he says, this is my message. This is what's so important. You better get right with the Lord lest you die. Think how this event with the Romans killing people who were trying to offer their sacrifices, think how how it would have affected people. And Do you think Christ made himself more electable by speaking the things of God? You know, he could, have been, he could have rallied a big crowd. He could have gotten really popular by telling them how good they are and how bad the Romans are. On top of their angry anger towards Roman occupation, how would most religious people respond? Let's take it out of the context of Rome now. How do religious people often respond? Well, it's a word you don't find in Scripture. It comes from... Eastern religion comes from Hindu theology. What goes around comes around. Karma. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I hear Christians talk about karma all the time. It is not a Christian idea. It is not a Christian idea. It it makes it it's horrible in practice. Somebody's sick in their bed instead of praying for them. The example is to love and bless and pray. Instead, we're saying, Well, what's wrong with them? They must be really bad sinners. Imagine somebody dying of cancer, and instead of understanding we live in a fallen world and everybody dies this side of heaven, instead of praying for healing, instead of loving them, we're, what's wrong with you? You must be a horrible sinner. We pile guilt on top of them. Or or people who believe in karma and they're they're praying, God, why don't you save me? It must be because I'm a horrible person. It must be because you don't love me the way you love other people. You see how that theology sucks? Natural religion tries to fit an explanation for everything that happens. We like to reduce the complexity of living in a fallen world to simple narratives. I guess they got what was coming to them. And we have a temptation to think, at least on some level, that those who have good lives must in some way be good people. He's got a lot of money. He must be good. And those who have troubled lives must deserve it. Jesus doesn't go there. He doesn't try to explain to us why things happen the way they do. Instead, he cuts to the chase. They died, and you are also going to die. Everyone dies, so you better get right with God. We don't have to be magicians trying to portend and look at the tea leaves, trying to figure out why things are as they are. We need to get our hearts right with God. And by the way, I'm going to get into this a little bit, but I want to hit it right now. Repentance. There's this idea of repentance. When you come to faith and you are saved, And we're adopted, and once you're adopted, you're part of the family of God, you can't leave. There's this also idea of continual repentance, this idea of repenting, which means getting ourselves oriented with God's way of thinking, saying, God, oops, I was out of bounds here, I need to get back in line with you, and repent daily to to get our hearts and minds aligned with God's will for our life. Contrast how Christ responds to the way some Christians act when someone's sick, again, God must not be healing you because you're a worse person than the rest of us. You're poor because God is not blessing you. If you prayed right, you'd get more stuff. This idea of karma, what goes around comes around. You know what? It is not compassion, is it? It is not compassionate. It is not comforting. And it ignores the reality that Christ saw. He said, do you think those people were worse than everybody else in Jerusalem? No. The reality that Christ sees is that we are all guilty. We all deserve eternal punishment. So we're we're trying to nitpick. Well, he's worse than me, and she's worse than me, and those folks. And God says, wait, 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 wait. Would you just be quiet? You're all bad. And that's why you need to repent. Don't say because the tower fell on those people that they're worse sinners, because their church burnt down that they're a worse church. Don't think that way. Y'all need to focus on getting right with the living God. Brothers and sisters, I'm getting worked up. And and I'm an introvert, (laughs) you guys know. Because we need to break this false religion in our hearts and minds. Why is it called human religion? Because it comes to us naturally. It's natural religion because it comes to humans naturally. And our Christianity can start to look like the religion of the world Unless we say no scripture alone. 
I'm coming right back to the Word of God. I'm not going to believe in karma. I'm not going to believe in, in good luck and all of these other things. I'm putting my faith in the living God. Everyone is a sinner. All of us will die. We must get right with the Lord. Is this, this is not necessarily a popular message nowadays. I see the pastors with big churches. They know how to affirm people and say, oh, you're, you're good the way you are. Don't talk about the cross. Don't talk about sin. But I'd rather talk like Jesus than talk like one of those guys. Amen. This, is, this is the benefit of going through Scripture the way we're doing it, little bit by little bit. So you don't think, well, I'm just hitting on the stuff I want to talk about. This is the message of Christ, isn't it? Repent, repent, repent. And if a dying world doesn't want to hear that they're repenting, should we not tell them? You know where I'm going with this, right? If we don't tell them, they're just going to die. I'm talking about eternal separation from the living God. Notice also that Jesus doesn't say that this was not God's judgment on sinners. We're not prophets. We can't say that tower fell on them, that car crash happened to them because God judged. But we know that we live in a fallen world underneath the judgment of God. Instead of trying to discern each and every situation, trying to follow out the threads of God's will, instead ours is to repent and to call people to repentance. Amen? Amen. And think about it. We spend so much time trying to mind-read God instead of reading his scriptures. Did God do this? Did God do that? Is God judging them? Or is God uh, using me in this situation? We, see, we say things like, everything happens for a reason, so tell me, so let me know the reason. But Jesus says, repent. If this is directly from God's hand, or if it's simply something that God has allowed, the consequences of living in a fallen world, guess what? Our response is the same. It's to get closer to God. So we don't need to read the tea leaves. Just get close to Jesus and we'll be fine. Just get close to Jesus and we'll be fine. And we don't have to do all the hocus pocus and try to pretend like we know everything. All right. Definition of repentance. We got into this a little bit ago. Did you know that repentance means, well, there's two ways of thinking, a Greek way and a, Jew, and a Jewish way, but they're related. The Greek way predominantly had to do with your mind. When it said repent, it means change your mind about something. And the Jewish way was to change your actions, which you can see how they tie together, right? They're kind of the same thing. But, but you're going this way, and you repent, and so you turn and go God's way. I think it's okay. I think gay marriage is okay, and nobody can tell me what to do. And God says, well, this is my will for you. You say, oh, God, I'm going to change my mind to align it with you. I think sex outside of marriage is okay, and who's going to judge me? Oh, wait. Scripture says that this is wrong Sex is for in the sanctity of marriage, right? And so I'm going to turn and I'm going to go God's way. Uh, p- culturally, it's easy to talk about uh, this ethnic group or that ethnic group. And when I'm around my buddies, we can, oh, wait. Jesus died for them. He loves everyone. We're all made in the image of God. I need to repent of my nasty, bigoted attitude and turn towards the Lord. See how that works? That's what repentance is. Do you know what repentance is not? I'm going to do things my way, but the Lord has showed me it's wrong. I'm so miserable. Do you know, it actually has nothing. In, we kind of deceive ourselves as Christians because we think repentance means I've got to work myself up emotionally. Don't worry about the emotions. Sometimes when we repent, there's tears, right? I think that's healthy. That's okay. That's good. But don't think you have to wait for the tears. Just, oops, that's not God's way. I'm going to go this way. That's not God's way. I'm going to change my direction and go his way. Don't wait for all the emotional fireworks to go off. Just reorient ourselves to the way God has called us to live. And also, so that's for Christians. Don't rely on your emotion. Just start going God's way again. But also, don't fool yourself into believing you're a Christian if you're not. Saying, I'm I'm repenting because I know it's wrong. And I'm just going to do what I want, and I don't care what God says. You know what? That's actually not repenting. So our salvation is not based upon our works. We're never good enough. But if you say, yeah, I, I know that God doesn't want me to lie, but I can make a lot of money by lying, I'm just going to do what I want. Are you showing faith? Are you showing that you trust God knows best in your life? No. 
See how that works? Natural human religion, natural religion, always wants to judge and decide who's the worst sinner. God doesn't play that game. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone needs to repent. And repenting means change the way you think and change what you're doing. God's God, I agree with you. I'm messed up. Your ways are best. I want to go your way. And then we stumble and we fall, but we have grace for that, right? What is grace for? Grace is for sin, right? But we have to be saying, God, I agree with you. Your ways are best. Your ways are right. That's faith. We think faith is something magical. So we make it so superstitious and mysterious. It's just trusting God. God, I agree with you that you know what's best for my life. You're the boss. I'm not the boss. I'm not going to call the shots anymore. Don't just talk about faith in God. Let your actions show that you actually trust him, uh, again, to rule your life. Okay, let's look at uh, chapter 13, 6 through 9 now. Then Jesus does that Jesus thing. He says, hey, guys, let me tell you a story. So he wants to illustrate what he's talking about with a parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and it was kind of just neat timing. A friend of mine from Australia, Chris Bird, uh, I've told you about him a few times before, but he, uh, he said, I'm sitting and eating figs off my fig tree. So that was kind of neat uh, as I was studying this passage. And, and uh, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on the fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? <laughs> Which, if you apply that to humans, cut it down. Why should it use up some of the oxygen in the room? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. <coughs> Several interpretations of this, and uh, if you were part of the Thursday evening group, you heard me say what I often say. We were in a difficult passage, and I said, I don't know what this means. Uh, you know, there's the old joke that, that uh, pastors aren't always right, but they're never in doubt. Uh, I, I don't want to do that, so, so I'm not exactly sure what this means. There's several interpretations that just don't seem to fit to me in context, Mostly variations on the idea that either the fig tree is Israel or the fig tree is the human race or the fig tree is uh, you know, the beginning of the church or, or human faith on earth uh, and God getting ready to end it, either ending Israel or humanity as a whole, and then nurturing and beginning the church, uh, fertilizing the, the seed of it with his blood, obviously, on the cross and waiting to see how it will do. That's possible. Uh, there is absolutely no way Jesus' audience would have gotten that out of what he said, right? Uh, but sometimes, honestly, prophecy can't be fully understood until later. So there's the local context, which they could have not understood, but was there a greater teaching? I don't know. I'm not super convinced of it. I know a lot of people see the church here. I'm not super convinced. There are plenty of other prophecies about the church that are a lot more clear. I'm more comfortable uh, proclaiming on those. To me, a simple reading of this parable it's not a difficult one. It's not complex. Jesus is telling the world in general and that crowd in specific, you better repent, you better change, and so show some fruit because I will take an ax to you. There will be a judgment. I think it was supposed to be scary. Repent, show some fruit of repentance because I've got an ax in my hand and it's not going to go on forever. You better get right with the Lord because judgment is coming. I want to take a little bit of a rabbit trail before I wrap up today uh, and talk about, I'm sure you all know what I'm going to say next, Donald Trump. Uh, it's easy, you know, for a conservative like me to rally against Donald Trump and say, he doesn't reflect my views uh, because I live in a politically liberal state. I put my church in a politically liberal town. Uh, many of my friends are much more liberal than I am. So when I say Trump doesn't represent my beliefs, I might even get a pat on the back from society, from uh, my people around me, some friends online. Uh, good job, yeah, you know, conservatives rally against him. Do you know what is difficult to say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know what's difficult to do? Act more like Jesus and less like our culture. 
Here's the thing. Our culture can't save squat. Our culture cannot save itself. It's like drowning in the water and saying, I'm going to grab my, well, for me, it'd be up here, I guess. You know? <laughs> grab, grabbing your hair and, and trying to pull yourself out of the water. It only happens in Looney Tune cartoons. You're, you're drowning in the water. Bugs Bunny grabs the ears and he pulls himself out of the water. That doesn't work. Our culture can't save itself. We can't save ourselves. So why should we take our cues from the people who are on a highway to hell they don't understand the things of God. And I'm living to get their approval because I'm denouncing Donald Trump instead of saying, you've got to repent from your wicked ways. The living God has an axe in his hands. Only Jesus saves. No politician is going to save us. So looking and talking like my culture accomplishes very little of eternal value. I often hear people say that fire and brimstone messages don't work in today's world. And sometimes I hear that from myself. So I'm one of those people. Uh, I often hear people say that fire and brimstone messages don't work in today's world, so we need to share the gospel differently. And there is some truth to that, and in some sense I agree. We need to be wise in the way we share the gospel. However, the underlying assumption to that, take a step back and think about it, is that if Jesus came to the United States today, the wandering rabbi, not as the coming king, if he came today like he did back 2,000 years ago, then he wouldn't be calling people to repent and get right with the Lord? Is that what we think? That he would say, well, the culture is different, so I'm not going to say get repent. He wouldn't say make your peace before you get to the judge like we saw last week, or else you will be cast in jail and never get out. He wouldn't say you better repent and show some real fruit for your faith, or I will bring an axe and cut you down where you stand. Do we actually believe that Jesus wouldn't have the same message if he came to our culture today. I don't believe that. Uh, that's the underlying assumption. I have absolutely no confidence that that is the way Jesus would act. I see nothing in the scripture to make me believe he would come with a veiled or a feel-good gospel. Not at all. The Lord never changes. That's an amen line. The Lord never changes. The gospel is timeless. And the message of 1 John 2, 6 didn't come with an exp expiration date. The one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk in Christ in the same manner as Christ walked. No expiration date for that. No cultural context for that. Romans 8, 29 tells us that if you are a Christian, God has predestined you to become like Jesus. If you are part of the people, if you are part of the group of people who are who are the children of Jesus Christ, you are predestined to become like Jesus Christ. You will be made perfect in the image of his Son. Luke 3, 8 says, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Show you grow. If we say, I believe in God, but I do as I please, God is not fooled. He is not mocked. He knows that you actually don't trust him to lead you, that that's not real faith. Let's be like Jesus. Let's put him first. Let's love other people enough to share them the gospel, share with them the gospel. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. So we have man-made religion, and we have true faith taught by Christ. And the gospels beat the Facebook meme, this is Jesus, be like Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, it's scary to live for you in this world, and we know that they rejected you, and we will face rejection as well. But Lord, how else can they hear the gospel if we don't preach it? Lord, help us to speak the true words, your truth. Help us to hold out your love in our culture, in, in the marketplace, in our workplace, uh, in our social arenas, Lord, everywhere we go, Lord. Help us to shine Jesus Christ, that when they see us, they see you, that when they hear us, they hear you, and Lord... The world needs this message of repentance. Let them hear it from our lips. We pray this in your name. Thank you, God, for using us. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.